Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. Back from hiatus and back in the month of June, I'm here with my good friends Technic and Nerd Bomber, and I'm Illegal Eighty Six. And this is the Online Warriors podcast. Wow. We now, wow. We now return you to your regularly scheduled warrior ring, and it's good to be here. The weather is getting, uh, I don't know, better presumably unless you're in like australia which is possible we aren't this is probably around the time the australian weather turns but i don't know i've never been there we are here in the in the good old us of a and we are going to be talking through some trailers this week we're also going to be talking through the sony state of play which had a lot of you guessed it trailers it's a trailer week and i love a good trailer let me ask you this though before we get into the we're gonna we're gonna get into some news we always do but I want to ask you guys, I want to kick things off, get us lubricated by asking a personal question of a very personal nature that I think is going to reveal a lot about each of us personally to the listeners personally. So I guess I'll ask the question by telling you about something that I did, which is this coming weekend. So we record on a Monday. So it's currently Monday. Yesterday was a Sunday. On Friday, my wife and I are taking a trip. Okay. I did laundry yesterday because i'm on a i'm on a typical sunday laundry cadence that's just the way i live my life and i brought my suitcase up and i packed my suitcase does that make me a serial killer sort of person or is that a normal is that normal behavior to ask a different way when do you guys usually pack for a trip the day before night before two days the day before two days before max okay so you guys are not flying by the seat of your pants necessarily but i'm a, I'm a planner I'm, I'm not, we have a, yeah we have a planned list yeah we make our list but then we pack it all the day before and then we go through the checklist because sometimes and this is also the same theory as if you get somewhere too early sometimes then you think you have too much time to kind of like dick around and then you end up being late and it's kind of the same with packing right if you pack too early you haven't really gone through your checklist or you think you packed something and you didn't and then you end up dicking around because you got too much time and then you forget something. Let me also pose okay. a situation for you. you please, please. You packed, right? Week ahead. You're yep. just getting ready for work. You woke up a little late. You're like, oh, shoot, I, I need underpants. You know where's a quick and easy pair of underpants that I can just grab and go? In the suitcase. The suitcase. So then you grab well, those but underpants. But then you forgot you grabbed those underpants. You know who's now shy underpants? You. Let me say the the chances of me doing that are 0%. This scenario that you've crafted. I understand the scenario you're posing, but the suitcase and the chest of drawers in which my clothes reside are two very different locations. Are you guys overpackers? I'm just, I'm trying to, again, like the, we're entering travel sure. season. I I'm a huge overpack. overpacker. Especially like... It's a serious problem. For me, I think the one time that I underpack. We had gone to visit Technic's family in like a beachy area. And so I was like, it's going to be beautiful and warm and beachy. And so I'm going to pack beach clothes. And then we ended up having to run right. out to a store because I was freaking cold and I needed to buy a pair of jeans and a hoodie to offset the coldness. So now I tend to overpack because of that experience. So I, I like plan yeah, for so every like scenario. A- I'm like, well, what if this day is cold? What if this day is warm? Right. What if, like, I'm you going out to a fancy dinner, so, so I need to pack a cold outfit for that fancy dinner and a warm outfit for that fancy dinner? And that that's just how my brain works now. Yeah, so it's it's a never again sort of motivation for you. I don't think I've ever had, like, a cautionary tale kind of experience like that. I'm just, it's just my personality. I'm just like, all right, I have a suitcase that's this big, and I'm going to use it, and I'm really going to use it. It's a, It's efficiency for me. And some people would argue efficiency is more so, like, packing the exact correct amount of what you need but to me efficiency is i'm going to be bringing this suitcase onto the onto the aeroplane either way so i might as well like really bring a suitcase like get some stuff in there now a question for yeah. you when you get home this is a tra- this is this is a travel podcast now. yes and i i think this is good because we're entering travel season this is people need to know so go on when you get home are you a wash right away or do you throw your bag somewhere or do you not wash the clothes that you didn't use like what is your thing because like we in our household we wash the entire suitcase even if we didn't wear something it is getting washed i don't want no bed bugs in my house but not everybody i will say probably to my discredit i am not a wash the entire suitcase person that said i have very and bed bugs aside, because that's a whole different thing. 
I have a fairly rigid suitcase segregation procedure for dirty clothes versus not dirty clothes. I tend to travel with at least one laundry bag at all times. So I have a system. That's all. I, I don't, we don't need to get into it. I've I never thought to pack a laundry bag. That's kind of clever. Always pack a laundry bag. Always pack a laundry bag. That's a, that's a pro tip for all you uh, future travelers out there. I will say, when I walk into the house, because one of the options I think you mentioned there in passing was just put the suitcase somewhere. When I walk into the house after a trip, I mean, I might not even go to the bathroom before unpacking my suitcase. I'm like, I'm done with the suitcase. Like I'm just like, okay, travel's over. I'm done with the suitcase. It needs to go back where it belongs. And in order for it to go back where it belongs, I need to take all these things out of it. So for me, that's like an immediate post-travel action which some, again some people would say that maybe is a, an unhealthy way to approach travel but uh look i'm not gonna apologize for it this has been oh also just one final travel like advisory before we move into the actual news and i think i might have mentioned this on the podcast already but if i haven't i just have to do this psa and i also i know that this is not necessarily something that everyone can afford i do think it's a very good deal and a very good value i have to say the tsa pre-check if you're if you're ever, if you're thinking like oh that's not anything, it's like it's amazing. My wife and I did that this year before we took a trip, and it's a very big deal. I think it costs I think it was like seventy something dollars, but it, you get for five years. So if you're if you're gonna fly like once or twice a year, you should you should be doing this. That is my uh, opinion, and it has revolutionized my opinion of air travel. Like I still don't like flying because I'm afraid of flying. But I'm so much less apprehensive in the days leading up to airport travel because of the TSA pre-check. I have. I don't understand that. Like, what, what? Which part? How do they just get to bypass metal detectors and all that other stuff? Let me say right off the bat, I completely agree with and understand this question. <laughs> like, I did go through. Well, both my wife and I went through a like screening process of sorts, which I imagine varies depending on your background. Now. If you can't tell just from the everything about me, I am not really a security threat anywhere, let alone an airport. So the screening process for me didn't feel all that involved, but they do. Like they like do, they like, I had to go somewhere and like, I think I got fingerprinted. Like they ask you a bunch of questions, like it's a whole thing, but it is a fair question of like, there's just certain, for those that don't know, the TSA pre-check is like, there are now just certain rules about going through airport security that I just kind of like don't have to follow. I mean, I've only used it, I think twice now, but that's enough times for me to feel like that's what the gist of it is. Like I don't take my shoes off. I think I have to, I'd have to check the tape on this. Don't quote me on this. Maybe run a fact check on me in the background listeners, but you know, that whole thing, right? To put your liquids in little bottles and put that put those little bottles into a plastic bag, that whole system. There's a, there's like a uh, set of numbers for it, like 411 or something. I don't know what the numbers mean. Uh, I don't have to do any of that because I'm TSA pre. And it's, it's interesting because I do agree that that like, it feels less secure. With that said, before TSA pre, every time I went to the airport and like went to go through security, I was like, wait a second, they changed the rules since last time. Like, I think the TSA, and like, it's a, probably a strategy. They're like always trying to keep you on your toes by like changing what you have to do, which I feel like makes their job a lot harder because like there's always people like taking their computer out and then there's some TSA guy whose whole job is just like, no, no, don't take your computer out because the people took their computers out last time and they thought they had to do that. So like in a sense, the rules themselves are really kind of nebulous to begin with, but the TSA pre-check is basically like, yeah, they're super nebulous to the point that like, just walk through this metal detector and we're going to scan your bag, but like any other hoops that other folks need to jump through you don't need to jump through because money so i think because money like that's it's you're really it's this is all a very fair point i don't i can't explain it from a logistical perspective i'm just saying for me it's worked wonders for my mental health vis-a-vis flying to me and and this is um, a little bit of my cynicism and then we can get into the show but to me it feels like they were like hey the odds of threats are really really low and we can skim some money off the top with this thing let's go that's probably true and it's i mean, I mean and, and also like I, I say this as someone who is about to go fly and like i'm not trying to be alarmist i'm just trying to be like factist like i think every so often every couple of years i don't know what the frequency is they'll like do these like what do they call them almost like um what's it's like a blind study kind of thing where like they will send people through tsa with like dangerous substances and or weapons and like 95% of them get through or something like it's it's like a crazy high and scary number so i think asking the question what is the tsa really up to 
Like, I think it's a, I think it's a valid question to ask. It's not to say they don't have any benefit because they certainly do, but I think TSA pre is pretty groovy. Like that's, I just, I, I, I think it's a, uh, if you are going to be flying a lot, especially if you're like flying for work, which like I was flying for work a lot for a while and I wish I would have had it then because I would have gotten even more benefit out of it. Anyways, if you're traveling soon, have a good time. I'm going to be traveling soon. We can be travel buddies. If you see me in the airport, uh, you're not going to know what I look like probably because this is an audio medium, but I'll be looking out for listeners who are just wearing like online warriors gear or something. Where I hope to see you is the PlayStation Showcase. Let's talk about the PlayStation State of Play, the Sony State of Play from May 2024. There's a lot to run through here. I, I, I tend to try and start these topic discussions on states of plays or showcases or everything, just kind of like summarizing what I felt the general vibe was. And we can kind of go around and, and you can correct me or, or deny my opinion. This felt like, this felt different to me than a lot of the state of plays have been for Sony in particular, in the sense that I think it was very gameplay focused based on the videos I saw. There weren't a lot of cinematic trailers happening. It was a lot of gameplay focused stuff, which I'm not necessarily against. I was getting a, get the sense of a lot of hack and slash and a lot of like, I don't, I don't know if JRPG is the right word. There was a lot here that I didn't feel like was for me. Let me start by saying that. We're going to go through these titles. There are a lot of things that did appeal to me, but there were also a lot of things where I was like, this is, this is not, my, not my cup of tea, which you could argue is like any showcase. But I do think we should probably start with maybe the biggest, I guess you would call this first party. I mean, it was the thing that was at the end, I believe... And it's a very interesting franchise, Astrobot. Astro what is your guys' exposure to Astrobot? I freaking love Astrobot. I don't know if you guys played the PS5 pack in the I think a little bit Astro's Playroom, like enough to it was it was useful of like I was like this is how the controller works. I played it long enough to be like oh this is a cool this is a cool way to show me all the cool things about the controller, and then I was like I'm going to play Spider Man Miles Morales, and I moved <laughs> on to that. If you like 3D platformers in the vein of Sackboy, in the vein of, I don't want to say Ratchet and Clank, but like maybe early Ratchet and Clank, stuff like that, you want to go back and give this a shot. Because I thought, especially for something that came free with the PlayStation 5, like this was super adorable. I thought the controller implementation here was really inventive and a, like you said, a really good way to like showcase all of the new features with the dual sense. I really yeah. liked it. And I when I finished playing it, I was like, I wish this was just a longer game because this just has so many good elements of your standard cutesy character driven 3D platformer. There were a ton of collectibles and callbacks. Like I think one of the main things if you finished Astro's Playroom, you collected like basically historical gadgets and hardware throughout PlayStation history. And then there was a big room where you could see all of the different consoles, peripherals, etc from every different PlayStation console. And it was just, I thought, super, super cool. And I'm, I was very excited about this. I think this actually has a shot to be like PlayStation's next mascot. I feel like they really haven't had one in a while. I think Sackboy was probably the closest they came back in like the PS3 era when Little Big Planet was a big deal. And Sackboy, don't get me wrong, was also an incredible 3D platformer game that came out for the PS5. But I think Astro's Playroom... Astrobot Rescue Mission and now just Astrobot. It's just such a tight package of really good platforming experiences. And like you said, it intentionally showcases the PS5 and all of Sony's contributions, including, you know, some of the tertiary things like they have their VR setups kind of winked in there. And then even beyond all of those things, it also kind of pokes a little bit at some of their competitors like Nintendo. In this in this trailer, we saw little winks of like the, the Triforce, and we also saw the tree from, like, Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. So, like, it's winking at the competitors, like, ha, look, we got something that can go toe-to-toe with your platformers, Nintendo. What up? And I love that. Well, and, yeah, it's it's definitely, I don't want to call it, like, a Mario stand-in, because it deserves more credit than that. But it is, like, that is the game it's trying to be. It's trying to be a 3D platformer. It's, you know, you mentioned all the hardware stuff, and, like, I, I wonder about the business arrangement with that of, like, is Sony going to Team Asobi and being like, make us a game that like is about PlayStation? Like it, it, it may well be. I honestly don't know. But the other thing too, hardware aside, is that there's also a lot of call outs to big PlayStation franchises like God of War. At one point we see the Leviathan Axe, Prapper the Rappa is in there. Like there's, there's other characters being shouted out. And 
I do think it's a really cool thing that like I, I guess is is the Astro franchise like is it always just the pack in game with the console? Is this the first standalone Astrobot game outside of that context? I don't know the answer to that. Well the original so Astro's Playroom, it wasn't a pack in with the PSVR, but it was basically to showcase the PSVR technology. It was a completely VR game. You went through and you basically guided Astrobot through a very similar 3D platforming world. Astro's yeah. Playroom then became kind of the showcase for the PS5. And I think because of the success of both of those games, they finally did give Team Hasobi like, hey, you can make a full size game now. Like, go for it. Right. So, the, yeah, was Rescue, which one was, because I played both. Because like, when I got the VR, I thought it was, I thought it did come with that the VR. Was, was that Rescue Mission? Yeah. I think that was Rescue Mission. Mm-hmm. And then Playroom was with the PS5. And yeah, it, it's it's a very cool concept. It's very inventive. It looks very, very well made. It looks graphically very top notch for for what the game is uh and it's coming september 6th obviously exclusively for ps5 it's kind of funny to think about this not being exclusive but yeah again a very very long trailer very gameplay forward and uh that was probably like i kind of wanted to leave with that because to me that was the headliner if not well one of the headliners if not the headliner but we can kind of go through here maybe do our, our classic style everyone you know, we'll go around and people can just pick games out of the list here. Nerd Bomber, was there anything that you were kind of were you really into? I don't know how that why it took me so long to say that. But. I don't know if I would say I'm really into it, but I think this was also one of the bigger announcements of the entire state of play. So, you know, Sony acquired Firewalk Studios. I believe some of the people in that studio are coming from Bungie. I'm not 100% clear on that, but they announced a new game called Concord, which is a 5v5 shooter that'll be coming out exclusively to the PS5 and of course like a PC launch. This one, it... It started so strong and then it was like, oh, it's just PvP. Well, it started very strong, but it also felt a little derivative of Guardians of the Galaxy, even down to the main character with the mohawk gave me like shades of who is the character in guardians of the galaxy is it yanu star lord no star lord's like yanu isn't it yes yanu gave me shades of that oh the arrow guy yeah like it seemed fun and like you're trying to get this ragtag bunch of anti-heroes almost together to create this group of people you root for but it felt a little derivative of guardians of the galaxy and i guess maybe that speaks to you know how successful guardians of the galaxy as a franchise both in the video game realm comic realm and movie realm has been that like they're so top of mind that any ragtag bunch of anti-heroes makes me think of guardians of the galaxy but then like i was like okay well i'm on board for this like bargain bin guardians but then it's like it's pvp i don't, I don't love that well it's it, it's interesting like my overarching thought on this which like i did there were parts of it that looked really good the gameplay looked really good but like there was another game recently that did this i can't think of the name of it right now but trying to kind of wedge story into a pv a purely pvp experience like this just feels very off to me like they you know there's there's this narration happening as you're watching basically pvp battles of like these characters like we have to depend on them and like blah 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 it's like okay but they're fighting other versions of themselves there can't really be a story right like what can the story be like it's 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 very strange to me and like they didn't lean too hard into that in the trailer but they like to put any story elements or hint of a story into the trailer for a game that is clearly just hey this is a 5v5 pvp pvp like just call it what it is i i don't know why they did that necessarily and honestly to and to kind of just jump into the next game, Marvel Rivals is another PvP that was showcased, and this has a better chance of doing that. You can say, okay, this week it's going to be this team versus this team, and whoever wants to play as them, that's going to play out that story. And they can keep rolling out new groups of characters that the teams can play as and actually flesh out a story. That has an opportunity for that. But no way does Concord with, oh yeah, this is you're gonna be versing yourselves. Oh, maybe a, a different color palette. And also like both of Rivals. these games, this is gonna sound bad, but I can't help but feel like all of these two games are just trying to replicate what Overwatch did very successfully, but it feels like about 10 years too late like is this just a second wave of this 5v5 hero shooter thing that we're getting here like it doesn't feel very original and i don't know if it would be enough to defect people away from overwatch and i know people is it have not some where issues. the money is though 
It's where the money is. That's, is that's what, well, that's because everyone thinks they're going to be an esports player. But like, is it though? Like, hear me out. So, Overwatch has Overwatch leagues, and I know people got upset when like Overwatch Two was a, a weird release and everything like that, and they lost some people there. But I don't know if these copycat games are going to have enough of a pull away from that main title to like i'm just thinking of all of the like Fortnite copycats that come and go super quickly and are a flash in the pan because they're just trying to copycat off of a popular format and it doesn't stick and i can't help but feel like this is going to be the same thing i hear you but i i and like i think with concord in particular that's probably true in so much as marvel as a brand is like kind of on the ropes right now and i feel like they're struggling like it's a brand with a lot of cachet like tactics said there's a lot of potential depth in terms of just how many characters you have at your disposal, I mean, they have all the rights. Like, I do think Rivals has a lot more juice. What I will say about both of these games, and like, there's going to be me sounding old for the first of probably many times as we talk through this state of play, but like, watching the Marvel Rivals trailer, I was like, this looks good, but like, it also, it looks really busy. Like, <laughs> like every five seconds, they were like, there's two to three characters that are teaming up, and they're doing something that I don't even know for sure what they're doing. And there's a lot of... There's just a lot happening. I, and maybe that's how Overwatch is. I have no experience with these PvP games, but like it also feels like Rivals in particular, it felt like they were being like, okay, it's a shooter, but also it's so much more because you can team up with your teammates constantly and create these crazy combos. And like, that is cool, but is it going to kind of dilute the core experience of what is presumably a shooter is, is another one of my questions about it. No, but it has more of a grounds to stand against Overwatch just because of the character pool. Right, and it's it, it, it stands to potentially be more new, more unique because of the very thing that I'm complaining about. But before we can continue, I will say no release date for Rivals yet. The closed beta is set for June. As far as Concord is concerned, that one, I believe, let's see. I think August uh, Concord 23rd. is going to be released august 23rd there is going to be a beta for that one in july so i do agree those two games are potentially in somewhat direct competition and also in competition with games that as you said nerd bomber have been out for quite a while we will see how that goes i will say just kind of continuing to move along through some games here i did not watch the ragnarok pc announcement trailer because i haven't played ragnarok yet and i didn't want even the most remote chance of being spoiled by anything so if there was anything worth talking about in that trailer, you guys can talk about it. But I, I, I'll I'm tell just you what it was. Not watching it because it's, on it's PC. too important to me. Yeah, it's mainly just it's on right. PC, <laughs> which you know, good on PC. September nineteenth, PC version will include the Valhalla DLC. Blah blah blah. I want to talk about, and I'm going to skip around a little bit now. I want to talk about Alien Rogue Incursion. Ew! This is a PS PSVR two game coming out for the holidays. I feel like every showcase, be it State of Play or the Xbox showcase or very much more rarely even one of like the Switch, whatever they're called, showcases, we see a game that you've watched the trailer and you're like, this wasn't ready. And to me, that's what this one was. <laughs> I feel like it wasn't ready. I feel like graphically it did not look very good and they didn't have much to show. This reminded and- me of robocop (laughs) with with the graphics where it was just like they're trying to recreate a franchise and they're just just they just doesn't look good right they're not even trying to recreate it they're just trying to milk it for something and like it's it's tough because like the alien franchise and vr should be a very good match i think horror is one of the better use cases for the vr hardware but like this is i don't i mean there's i wouldn't need to talk about it anymore just it didn't look ready like it's, and what's, it, it didn't look ready they didn't show us very much and what they showed us looked not great so what's interesting they too need to think through this a little more is it's exclusively on the vr psvr2 and so Cor- it, correct. It, it should be that step above right if if, if it was playable on both then okay fine whatever you had to cut some processing power out of there whatever but no not this one i think that sticking with vr i think the only other vr title that came up i think behemoth that looked good looked far i was in better that. yeah i still don't think it's something i would necessarily buy if only because i'm not planning on getting the vr too but like to me that one looked notably better that looked i don't really understand cool. how you play that game how do you play it without dying because there's a there's, there's a bunch of giants, it looks like. That's why the game's called Behemoth. It looks like you're always getting stepped on. But that looked like a cool potential 
use of like the medieval setting in VR. Like I, I think that one had a lot more thought put into it than Alien Rogue Incursion, which was basically just like, hey, you're in VR and oh my god, the xenomorphs there. Like that was that. <laughs> that's all the trailer was, and I didn't feel like there was a whole lot there. Tactic, I I haven't given you a chance to shout anything out yet. I know you kind of dove us into rivals, but what else, if anything, do you want to to mention here? So I know they mentioned they had they did show a Monster Hunter title, but the one that actually I thought was kind of cool looking was Ballard of Antra. This looked like a I I, I my notes call it a Shadow Realm RPG with Monster Hunter vibes. You had this vast exploring beautiful world, all of these creatures that you're taking on, and it looks like it has the potential to have a really interesting story behind this rpg and i i was i was very much into this one i i kind of want to see more and see what the plot point is behind it but very visually stunning and it looked cool i would say it's a day one buy because it's going to be free to play (laughs) it's free to play so it's a day one buy for everybody really ballad of antara did stick out a little bit from a few other games that came up that i felt like looked very similar Again, like that was one of the ones I was like, this is kind of hack and slashy, which is not typically my genre. But you mentioned Mon- Monster Hunter Wilds. I have not played a single second of any of the Monster Hunter games. So I don't really have much of a horse in that race. I struggle with Monster... So we can jump right into Monster Hunter Wilds. Sorry for kind of commandeering yeah. this. But no, no, I no, struggle means- with the Monster Hunter franchise as a whole, specifically because of the combat mechanism. If you get knocked down or you're, it's like you're frustratingly slow to get up. And we even, and this is a mechanic that I want them to improve. And we even saw this in this gameplay trailer. I was like getting anxiety watching him try to struggle to get up, to go oh, back to the old grindstone. And I need, I need that quickness. I need that, that like agile combat or else it's just like, it just becomes frustrating and I feel almost like a, a helpless member. And the story looked captivating, sure, but the combat's got to be tight. Yeah, I mean, it looked like you're kind of just... Oh, most of the trailer was basically just a guy with a giant sword standing in front of a woolly mammoth doing various things to it. And like, I did like... There was that like, not a horse that you rode, but like some kind of thing you could ride that like, it'll come pick you up when you tell it to. That looked cool. But again, having absolutely no connection to this franchise, that one that one kind of just washed over my eyeballs. Now, I'm frustrated. And again, I feel like this is becoming a hallmark of various showcases. There were two games here that they were like, oh, this is the second one of these games. And I'm going to focus on Silent Hill 2 because Silent Hill 2, as you guys know, I'm a survival horror guy. I have not played any Silent Hill games. This Silent Hill 2 remake has been talked about for a while. It's coming out October 8th on PS- PC and PS5. We got a trailer for it. I watched all of it. Looks extremely scary. My first question was, where is the Silent Hill 1 remake? Because I can't just start with Silent Hill 2. And I'll save anyone else Googling. There is no Silent Hill 1 remake. So why are they making a... Si- Can someone explain this to me? Why are they making a Silent Hill 2 remake? I don't... If there's no Silent Hill... is. That's I, weird I don't play I don't these scary it. games, but I want to say that the story, and I might be wrong here. I might be thinking of Resident Evil. Somebody fact check me. But I think the characters that you follow in Silent Hill 2 is like a different set of characters from the first game. So it doesn't really matter. And I think Silent Hill 2 is considered to be like the better starting but point. But it's still in Silent Hill, right? Like it's the same town. Like there's got to be some kind of connective tissue. Maybe you're right that there's none, but like even if there's some, I would like to play the first one. I'm just I'm a chronology guy, I guess. But um it looked really good. Like I I looks super super scary, which I'm up for that every once in a while and Why you know October 8th is exactly games? the right time for this to be to be terrified. The other sequel V1 that I was like, "Oh, this looks actually good, but I have no connection to the franchise is Path of Exile 2." This one, I don't have a much much specific to say about it other than I think it looked fun. Um, I think the... Is it isometric? Is that what the view is? Yep. Yeah, this was a, a couch co-op isometric view dungeon crawler, for those of you who don't know. Yeah, and they were teasing couch co-op, cross-play, and cross-progression, which I don't know if I've ever seen a game tease cross-progression before, but uh, I thought that was interesting. It's also going to be free to play. I, well, I was about to say, I don't know... If I'm going to play this, but if it's free to play, I guess I don't have much to lose. And like, this is another one that like, I didn't do as much Googling on this one as far as like, what is the connective tissue between this and whatever the first Path of Exile was? 
maybe I will eventually find out. Nerd Bomber, back to you. Anything else that we have missed? I think we're close to having hit almost everything. But... Yeah, we've hit almost everything. Infinity Nikki, I initially was like, this looks dumb. And then it got into like a 3D platforming part of the game. And there's kitties, which I don't really understand where the kitties come in. But there's like, it felt like there were more 3D platforming elements. And we all know I'm a sucker for a good 3D platformer. So like, I don't think I would like buy this at full price. But if it went on super sale or something, like if Deku Deals showed me it was at the lowest price ever, maybe I'd pick it up. Did you get 3D platformer Princess Peach vibes? Yes, I did. Okay. That's what I, I, didn't, I, had. I didn't get this one. Like, yes, I got those vibes, but I also like, if you read like the description of this game, it's like, she's like a fashion designer or something. I didn't understand what the game was trying to be. And there's like, like you're there's taking characters. photos and exploring. It's very interesting, the different mechanisms. In this game. <laughs> and then at the, at the very end, they like teased some very dark story element. I was like, I don't know what's happening here. The whole thing was just, just came together in a very confusing way for me. But yeah, the other ones we haven't mentioned, I don't know that we need to get too into them. Where Winds Meet martial arts game this was the one where i think they were fighting in like trees the whole time which was kind of wild but then there was another one that was i felt somewhat similar which was dynasty warriors origins i okay so <laughs> i disagree with okay. that statement yeah please where wins me looked like a cool almost like ninja fighting rpg and and the combat look, looked quite nice dynasty warriors looked like a horde phone app game all of the the mechanics on the enemies were like ragdoll mechanics and you're just flipping around like they're just nothing it's just completely one-sided and you're just battling hordes of nothing enemies and that just feels like yeah akin to almost like a like a phone app mobile game whereas so what i where the winds meet yeah, like what, i said I, good comment what i wrote down for dynasty warriors origins was Imagine being a soldier on a battlefield in feudal Japan and you guys are like doing okay in the battle. And then like some guy shows up who just every time he swings his sword, 50 guys go flying. <laughs> like it does feel like very, I don't understand the mechanic. Uh, like I, I think, yeah, calling it a phone game is like probably pretty accurate. Not My that exact I've a lot of phone notes were ilk, but. Dynasty Warriors, the ragdoll game. That's it. That's my notes. Yeah. <laughs> so do not compare them. <laughs> I think that covers everything. The only did until we dawn got a new until, trailer. Yeah, but that was the only it. other one. Was the until dawn announcement? I Ner Bomber's favorite game until dawn. I can't with that. It, she, I'm I'm sure she's very excited <laughs> for this to come out. It's slated to arrive on PC and PS5 sometime this fall. I don't think we missed anything, but if we did, hit us up on Twitter. At OWLeo86 is me. We have at OWTactic, at OWNerdBomber in our main show account. At OnlineWarriors1. What did you like from this showcase? What did you not like? I should call it the state of Blake's. That's what it was. What did you like? What did you not like? What should we have talked about more? What were we wrong about? What were we right about? Twitter is the place for that discussion. We're going to take a short break now and come back to talk through a couple of trailers as well as what we've been up to. But before we talk through all that, it's that time of the week once again. Mr. Stephen Keller, take a bow. As the Patreon producer on this podcast, Stephen gets this producer shout out every week. He gets input into the weekly game segment, of course, uh, the occasional guest spot on the show, and access to the monthly secret segment and the monthly vlog. Stephen gets all these things because he supports us at the highest of our three levels of Patreon subscribership, which is the night level. There is the night level. There is also a squire level of support, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog and a page level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. So again, or actually not again for the first time, you can go to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast to get the details on any and all of those levels of support. You can consider being like Steven. You can consider getting this shout out on the show and the many other benefits that I mentioned. Thanks again to Steven. We'll be right back to talk about Venom the Last Dance and a family affair. I'm Ryan Fonzie. This is Cameron Hagee. My name is Tony Giggles. And we're three dudes who love The Legend of Zelda and love talking about The Legend of Zelda. And if you are a Zelda fan as much as we are, then come on down and listen to your heart's content. 
we have a podcast that we'd like to share with you. It's called A for No, B for Yes. We cover the Legend of Zelda series, different games chapter by chapter, and we have all kinds of theories about what we see and what we've experienced in the game. Do you go through Wikipedia and look up stuff based on the things you see in the game to create theories to how it could link to other things in the world that we actually live in and not the Zelda one that was the one that was created by the people that are in the world that we actually live in right now? Because if you don't, then you should watch this because we do. Did you guys get all that? If not, oh, you didn't. Okay. So we are A for no beef. All right, I'll stop. All right, we're back to talk about a family affair. No, I'm not talking about the sitcom that aired in the 60s because i that was the first thing that came up when i googled family affair but that's not it i'm talking about the weird movie that netflix is coming out with in late june where nicole kidman and zach efron get it on we don't need to talk about this one for too long i i I have really like two to three points i want to make about this point number one and this point is coming mostly from my wife but i agree with her nicole kidman has the world's worst agent that or she picks the worst projects because her track record in the past 10 years in particular is absolutely horrific for how good of an actress she is. Point number two, I think Netflix needs to get out of the rom-com game. And I say that as someone who loves rom-coms, but the last few Netflix rom-coms that I've watched have been not good. They've been excessively average. That's it. They're not bad. Do you think... The airplane one... Do you expect this movie to be... The airplane one was okay. Do you expect this one to be average? I think the the story will be good, but the, the... Actor selections, not great. That's my stance. Well, you're bringing me to my th- to my third point, which is, so we recently had a movie on Amazon Prime where Anne Hathaway falls in love with a hunky teenage pop star boy, right? I don't remember the name of it. I think it's, I, th- I imagine that these movies are coming about and are being made with good intentions. And that may or may not be true, but I think the intention is to look at the trend in Hollywood for like however many movies that have come out in the past 50 years of like, oh, it's a guy and a girl and they fall in love. The guy, he's 50. Or no, sorry. Yeah, the guy is like 50. The girl is like 22. Like, how many movies have you seen like that? I'm There's fine a lot. with that. I just think it it's, was weird casting choices. Well, so, um, yeah, the casting choices we'll get into. But like, I think... I think that's the point of the Anne Hathaway movie. I think it's the point of this movie, too, is like, hey, let's flip the script, like, be it in the interest of of gender equality or just changing social norms, whatever they may be. But the difference is it becomes the whole point of the movie that it's a quote unquote older woman and a guy. And I feel like that makes it kind of weird. I, I don't I don't know. Like, it feels obtrusive. And yes, I do agree that. Zach Efron and Nicole Kidman is a very strange it's a strange pair. I don't like, know if I if I believe that at all. Yeah, and, and like like I said, I'm with the premise personally, Nerd Bomber and I is basically Zach Efron and Nicole Kidman in age. It's just I just don't like that casting Ex- choice. Wait, ho- hold up, what? Yeah, yeah you're he's doing a goof. You're a cougar and I'm I'm the young, Get the young out of buck here. in this situation. Also, I believe uh, and I'm I'm doing a live fact check here. Based on what we saw in the trailer, I believe Kathy Bates is supposed to be the grandma and Nicole Kidman is supposed to be the how, mom. How far apart in age are they? That's what I'm looking up right now. Uh, okay, actually, it's, it's pretty reasonable. They're 19 years apart. Kathy Bates looks good for her age because I thought Kathy Bates was significantly younger than 75 years old. So Damn, I'm going to get off get my it. high horse and I'm going to take that point back. But yeah, so Nerd Bomber, you're, I mean, you're not going to be seeking this movie out. It's just going to come on Netflix and you're saying that you're going to give it a shot. Maybe. I mean, we still haven't watched the Anne Hathaway movie, but I'll be you know, Are you intending it. to? Just I mean, for... when Anne I, Hathaway is going to be first, though. When I run out of rom-coms yeah. and I need a rom-com to watch, they will be eventually up at bat. That's we just watched how, a, uh, how it the, works. The last film we watched on Netflix the last rom-com we watched because like i will get it in my mind in my heart to like watch a dumb rom-com and boy can netflix deliver on that just in terms of offering that title to you but we watched a movie and again i'm trying to google what this movie was called plus one did you guys ever watch plus one if you didn't like this movie you can go get out it is here. the first movie plus one is the first movie in a very long time that i that my wife and i were like we why don't we should turn this off this was it's, not a netflix movie also by the way this was a hulu original that netflix picked up 
Uh, okay. This well, I stand corrected on the Netflix original original part, but it was a bad movie. Quaid yeah, I'll, Jr. I'll, I'll die on that hill. I, I don't think it was Quaid a bad Jr. Movie. And what was it? Maya Erskine? Yeah, Maya Erskine's in it. I think what made the movie so unwatchable was that I felt like they were both very capable leads that had got a very bad script. From what I remember of the half of it that I watched. So essentially, like, I literally you're can't stand this. I'm turning it off. That Yuri rom com snob. Because I remember actually liking I don't, this one. I don't think I, I. I don't think I am saying that because I, I. My favorite rom com is Hitch, and I think most people would tell you that that is not. That is not a rom com snob kind of movie. We can we can agree to disagree, but this has, a family affair. Hold on, I, is, I just want to say that you're wrong because I <laughs> fuck the critics. They <laughs> gave you an eighty. You've already. You've, well, they gave them an eighty-eight percent tomato meter score. Fuck the critics, though. Seventy-nine percent audience score. I think you're wrong on this one. This is very watchable. Don't sway people away from an, this movie. It's got an eighty-eight. That's honestly mind blowing to me. This movie got an eighty-eight percent. I'm mind blown that you score. couldn't make it through the entire movie. I remember liking this. It. I. I again. I. I stand by it. I did not like this movie. Uh, I didn't even finish it. Maybe it's because I didn't finish it that I didn't like it. But man, I think we got like forty-five minutes in. We got more than halfway. Now Maybe I'm on the more like this page. Well, yeah, I'm I'm on the more like this page, and if you want to talk about rom coms that came out on streaming services that absolutely had juice, do yourself a, a favor and watch Destination Wedding with Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder, which has very bad Rotten Tomato scores, but I loved it. I I, See, I guess what I'm I proving that is was that kind of meh. I, what I'm probably proving is that it's a very subjective genre. And man, did I not like plus one. Man, for all I know, I would love a family affair, but I don't, I think the chances are very low. I, I just, I can't get over, trailer. I'm sorry. I just can't get over how like a hundred percent holistically wrong you are about plus one. And that is just going to eat at me, man. Holistically wrong. Yeah. Look, you're, I mean, look, you're entitled to your opinion. I just, I, I don't know. I couldn't get there. Let's move on. Cause we're not going to find any, we're not, we're not going to find common ground on, on, plus, on uh, no, I almost said plus one. We're not going to find common ground on that. I don't think we're going to find common ground on rom coms in general. Let's see if we can find common ground on Venom: The Last Dance, which is basically Venom three. We got a trailer for this. It's coming October twenty fifth of this year. And oh boy, guys, I did not see Venom two. Let me just start by saying it was good, that, which I believe was called Venom: Let There Be Carnage. Let me tell you where this trailer lost me because this trailer did lose me. It was the hey lady from the convenience store suddenly we're in vegas Let's i dance. loved that part scene lost me completely what are we doing i think what was that he, what was that i think he's just coming here with his bad takes today and uh yeah i, I don't love it i don't love it so I'm, in, I, I'm entitled to those bad takes well so I let me let me see the second one let so. me give a good take this has has done it folks it's completely deviated from my knowledge of where the heck it's going in the comic books i have no idea and i'm excited for that this just seems like a fun venom ride we're gonna see a lot of cool monsters a lot of cool action scenes a lot of humorous moments and and tiebacks to the originals i'm interested if we'll see any more scream or toxic or carnage or any of those those other symbiote folks we didn't really get much of a tease of that besides the little gooey balls, we'll call them. But it looked it looked funny. It looked good. It looked like a good time. I, I don't know how you can hate on this at all. I think to me, what is sh- like shocking and surprising, as given your bad take here, is that as somebody who loved the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man series, to me, this kind of embodies that sort of series. I am typically superheroed out. Like the last few years that's a superhero thing i don't want to see it but because this is a standalone i mean i know there's weird crossovers and like after credit scenes but for the most part this is a standalone series of superhero movies that are just they kind of harken back to that 2000s vibe where it's just one guy a lot of silly action a lot of silly comedy there's no serious pondering that i have to do that has to be broken up by silly one-liners like the entire movie is just decent comedy paired with some action like I don't know. I didn't like the first Venom. I was just a little lukewarm. I thought it was pretty average. But the second movie, I felt like really redeemed the series. And then this one just looks like it's going to close out this trilogy and be a really fun ride and probably put Venom up there in terms of like top superhero franchises in a little bit. I want to touch on, I can't pronounce this guy's name, Reese Reese Witherspoon. 
No. <laughs> the guy who played the lizard in The Amazing Spider-Man. You guys know the person yeah. I'm talking about, maybe? Anyways, he's in this movie. He shows up in the trailer very briefly. I did see him in it. I don't know if he's supposed to be the lizard or not. Obviously, uh, based on a quick Google, everyone is assuming that he is the lizard, which I think would be very disappointing. I, I don't know that the, whether that's true or not. I just wanted to toss that in there as like something that people are... Pe- folks are chatting about it. I... Look, I mean, I'm a little bit predisposed here because I saw the first Venom and I didn't really care for it. I thought it was like very mid. Um, it sounds like you guys are big fans of this franchise, which, uh, you know. So the first one was, was okay. Go off. The second one got better. And so th- to me, it, it this is almost like like a fungus, which is uh, imperfect as far as symbiotes go. They grow on you, right? So I give the second one a chance, and and it might it won't be mid. It'll be like like upper mid. Yeah, I mean, do, quick quick research suggests that the second one was a pretty significant box office success. It got quote unquote mixed reviews from the critics. I'm not willing to look into it. Screw a the lot critics. Tell right me now. the audience score. Yeah, critics suck. I'm not on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm on Wikipedia, so I don't actually know what the uh, audience score right was. Here. I, yeah, I mean, I'm open to it. I'm a little bit indifferent. I just Critics like, gave it a 57. Audience score gave it an 84. Come through, audience. The the audience love continues from, from Nerd Bomber. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not against it. I just don't, maybe I don't get it. Also, I didn't find the humor in the trailer to be particularly f- funny at any point. But again, maybe it's just not for me. I, it, when you say the second one was better, I believe you. Because I do think that the first one, when I watched it, I thought to myself multiple times... This could have been a lot better. So on the second one, I would have expected them to hopefully make do on that. The Last Dance, October 25th. I have a feeling I'm going to get flamed in the comments on this one. Flamed in the tweets for not being a fan of this trailer. But it just wasn't doing it for me. I, sometimes it's as simple as that. And you've you've both referred to it as a bad take. And uh, I'm going to go down with that ship, I think. I'm not gonna, you're not going to change my mind, at least, at least in, this, in this venue. But maybe the movie itself will prove me wrong. Let's move on to what are you up to Wednesday. This is the part of the show where we talk about what we've been up to. Uh, We've had a a week break here, so I feel like we probably all have a decent amount to get into. So I'm going to turn it over to Nerd Bomber to kick us off here. Oh, boy. Okay, so I've been up to a lot. Let's start with video games. I started playing Brotato. Stop me if I already talked about this. But it's kind of like Vampire Survivors. Very same concept waves you have and- talked about it okay by all means by all means continue to but you you have all right i wasn't sure so brotato i've been playing it i am now up to the fifth difficulty level which is the final one i have tactics it is fun i pop on music i have a good time i also read a bunch of books in the last like two weeks i got on a real book bender uh two of the books are actually books from your pal illegal so he may have bad takes in terms of his movies but he's got some pretty good takes in books so i read this storied life of aj fickery which was really good and now is a movie i'm going to put on the docket to watch maybe this weekend this is by gabrielle zevin and it follows the an owner of a small bookshop on an island small community and he loses his wife this is not a spoiler this happens like before the book even starts and like the book opens with this and he kind of finds himself in a rut and then there's a series of just things that continue to happen to him and how he reflects on his life and kind of tells his life stories and all of the things that have happened to him as he kind of reopens his heart up to life around him through you know books and passages from books so that was a great book. If you like like A Man Called Ove or any of those type of books, like this is probably right up your alley. Very feel good, heartwarming story. And then I also read This Is How You Lose the Time War, which was fantastic. I feel like I don't want to tell you too much about this book because I feel like it's good to kind of go in a little bit blind and just discover what's happening as you read. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to know how to lose it. I want to learn how to win it. Is is it heavy on the romance? Is that a broad enough question for me to ask? Or is that too specific still for you to answer? At its heart... You, you reserve the right to not answer. At please. its heart, it is a romance book, but it's not your standard romance. I feel like it's more of a sci-fi book first. and But the romance is like at the heart of the sci-fi story, if that makes sense. It does. And, and, and like to be clear, I'm not saying... I'm not asking that because I'm like going to be turned off by it being... It's it's not hot, like hard on the romance. I'm just curious. It's really. not like your Fabio type romance. It's it's not your standard like chick lit romance at all. It is at its heart a sci fi novel. 
first and foremost. But it's just a romance story in a sci-fi novel package, if that makes sense. Yeah, I got this book for you as a gift and then didn't give you the gift for a while. And there were a couple of times when I was like, what if I just read it first? <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't do that. But this is on my quote unquote short list of books that I would like to read. So I, that's why I wanted some insider info. It was absolutely fantastic. And then going outside the realm of books, we started watching Aquafina is Nora from Queens. And it's pretty funny. I don't really have a whole lot Rough to say about start, it. Rough start, but, but like, then it gets good. Yeah. The first season, like, y- she has to tone it down a little bit. The first few episodes, she comes in real hot off the out of the gate as, like, a stoner loser. But then her character starts to evolve and become a little less extra. And then it becomes more of an ensemble cast comedy, which is great. Grandma is top notch. So, yeah. Co- comedies need time. They there's do. Just, there's so many examples they of that. Do. They need time. Typically a, a season of time. Very cool. Tech Deck, you want to take the reins? Okay, so there's two things I want to talk about. The first thing is we watched Vacation Friends 2. There is a sequel, folks. I thought Vacation Friends 1 was a little bit better. This one kind of jumped the shark on the on the plot. The first one was just kind of zany friends on an adventure. This one was like zany friends. Now they're running from people shooting at them and it just like it went a little bit beyond i thought as far as what can happen but i guess when you have zany friends you you gotta keep upping the ante so it was entertaining i thought the first was better but definitely like a turn your brain off for an hour and a half and and watch john cena do john cena stuff was really kind of the crux of it and then the other thing is with summer on the horizon one of the things that i'm really excited about is got the pool Got the pool all together. Took off. We have an above ground pool. Good cover off. Got all the plumbing. Good to go. Oof. It is time for some dipping. And that's my. So have you have, have you di- have you dipped yet? Uh, my Man, hand. I, I just got it officially balanced t- today. Oh, today. Okay. So you're you're prepped and ready to go. Very hype. Well, that just leaves me. I yeah. I'm in between games. I stopped playing Deathloop because I encountered a bug that annoyed me so much that i stopped playing it shout out to the menu bug in death loop if you know what i'm talking about hit me up in the tweets because we should have a conversation so i'm in between games right now but i wanted to shout out a book and i wanted to shout out a movie the movie netflix documentary called butterfly in the sky this is a this is an hour 25 minutes not even an hour and a half and it is as you may have guessed from the title about the show reading rainbow which was on tv from 1983 to i believe the mid 2000s starring lavar burton at the bottom line is you either know what i'm talking about right now or you don't and the show is a very or the documentary is a very feel good you know little trip down memory lane about how the show was made how important it was the struggles they had in terms of keeping avoiding like being defunded and canceled and all that things so that part is a little bit of a downer but they focus on it a lot less than just how positively influential the show was so you could do a lot worse in terms of documentaries wanted to shout that one out and then I just finished a book that I had started reading actually in the two-week gap in between uh, a previous episode. So it's a book called Everyone in My Family Has Murdered Someone, and it's by an Australian author named Benjamin Stevenson. This is, you guys know I'm all about the whodunits. Bomber and Tactic also know that I'm all about the whodunits because they just got me a new one, which is the next book on the list. But this book was about a family reunion. It's a golden age mystery, and if you don't know what that means, you I'd, I'd encourage you to fall down that Google rabbit hole, but basically think Agatha Christie and, and authors from like the 1910s to the 1930s, basically sequestering a bunch of characters in a location for a very short amount of time, having a murder happen, et cetera, et cetera. The twist, which is kind of coming through in the title, is that this is a family reunion and every member of the family has at one time or another killed someone, therefore making everyone a reasonable suspect. And it's a very, very interesting story and it's very well presented in the sense of it being very unique and the author is very upfront that he will never cheat and he never does so it, it's very interesting in that regard it's also a very short read i i started it two weeks ago but then i had to put it down for a while because i was very busy with other things and i wound up reading most of it like 80 percent of it in the past like three days because i had to return it to the library shout out to libraries but yeah a great book i'm going to be reading the sequel at some point which I believe is called Everyone on This Train is a Suspect. And there's one coming out for the holidays called 
everyone this Christmas has a secret or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. So shout out mystery novels. I am now going to be starting Nerd Bomber. Is it the seven and a half deaths of Eve- Evelyn Hardcastle? I know it's a weird number. I can yes, it the is number. seven and a half. Okay. Have you have you murdered somebody? I've not murdered anyone yet. Anyways, let's uh, get into the game. This is a big week for the quiz. It always is. So on the quiz tracker, Nerd Bomber 8 and 5, she will be hosting today. She is the queen bee, so to speak. I am at 7 and 5. Tactic 5 and 9. Steven, 1 and 1. So Tactic, we're entering, we're, we're closing in on the halfway point of the year. And, uh, you know, the gap right now is not large, but I take it from someone who knows, I believe I lost last year, that gap's going to get out of control pretty quick if you don't start to stem the bleeding. So with that said, Nerd Bomber, the floor is yours. All right. So this week's quiz is about Castlevania. As per usual, this is all numerical based trivia. So whoever gets the numerical answer that is closest to the correct answer without going over will get a point. And there's five total questions. You each get a lifeline which is either a plus one of your opponent's answer or the number one. And you can only do that once per game. All right. Are we ready? Who's going first? It's me because I have a better record. All right. And I'm ready, yes. So the first obvious question here, when was the first Castlevania game released? What year? Let me start by saying, as I often do, that I don't know anything about Castlevania. I've never played any of the games. Therefore, I should be perfectly poised to win this quiz. This was the the early to mid 80s i feel fairly confident i'm gonna say 1982 that feels like the correct number i think you're just a smidge too early i thought it was in the 70s so i'm just gonna play it safe and say 1960 you so thought you're he was a smidge too late yeah you thought he was too early that oh whatever he gets the point it was released in 1986 so who gets the point illegal let's go. okay i that'd be me that'd be me that your boy let's go baby All right, so there have been many games over the years. How many platforms have Castlevania games been released on? Nine. That's a strong guess, so I think it's time to bust out the plus one, and I'm going to go with ten. Right, and Illegal gets his second point of the night. There are actually games released across 32 different platforms. Keep in mind, the first game was on the NES, and there have been many, many consoles and handhelds released since then. I'm surprised the number was so high. I really did think it wasn't just me like slamming on you, Tactic. I think that was legitimately a good guy. I was expecting like 12. So I went with 10. And yes, I'm going for a no mercy approach. Hopefully it pays off. All right. So the next one up, the Lords of Shadow timeline contains three games. This is like a story arc, basically. Castlevania Lords of Shadow, Castlevania Lords of Shadow, Mirror of Fate, and Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2. Over how many years does this entire timeline arc span, according to the Castlevania wiki, where they have timelined everything? You're asking because it's a lot, is my guess. I'm just going to just say something weird. I'm just going to say 1,500 years. 1,500. see what I did there? Yeah. You guys are on the right track. (laughs) This is a franchise about vampires and whatnot. However, you overshot just a little bit. Come on. Oh, let's go, baby. 1,010 years. So you guys busted. Okay. So, I mean, I I was guessing in earnest, trying to guess the correct answer, but I was in my best strategic interest to go high. So uh, I stand by the outcome. It was, it was a, like, it makes sense. You're talking vampires. It's okay, Tactic. You still have two more chances to tie it up. I mean, you can be snarky, but put your best foot forward here. It's not directed towards you. You got two more questions to redeem yourself. Because it's currently 2 nothing right now. So you have two questions. If you get these right, you're back in it. So Castlevania became an animated series on Netflix in 2017, I believe. How many episodes are there in total across all seasons of the show, which is complete as it stands right now? I believe it's complete. But how many episodes are there currently? 72. That feels like way too much. I didn't hear about this show's existence. So I'm going to go with 20. 20. All right. So Illegal takes this one. He also takes the game. There are 32 episodes spread across four seasons. Sorry, Tactic. He's crying right now. Just brutal stuff. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I said no mercy. Actually, you said no mercy. And then I said, yeah, you're right. But there's, there's one, one question. More question. Get, get some, yeah, achieve some, I don't know. Bring, try to get the Get some one. honor here. Try not to get the sweep. So Castlevania, the concert was a musical event held at the Stockholm Concert Hall on January 19th, 2010, performed by the Youth Stockholm Philharmonic Orchestra. How many songs from the Castlevania series 
were played at this concert. Well, I mean, if you want to get your money's worth, it better be at least an album's worth of songs. So I'm going to say 16. Feels like a good number. 16. And I can't. I'm going to say 22 because... He avoids the sweep. 26 songs were played at this concert. Uh, yeah, I'm not going for you. So what that means is that I moved to 8 and 5. I am now tied with Nerdbomber for Quiz Supremacy. Tactic moves to 5 and 10, and next week he will determine whether Nerdbomber reclaims the throne. In other words, I will host. What's the worst that happens if I lose, right? I could just say, oh, I got to do the thing that I'm never going to do, right? That's that's true. That is, you uh, that you is do the have to still watch it. We will hold you to this. Get Hawk, I boot it up. <laughs> get it booted up it's it, obviously it's like more likely to happen like thanksgiving time when like it feels appropriate right now it feels ridiculous you have to you have to understand that thank you all for joining us on this week's episode of the online warriors podcast hope you had a great time head over to apple podcast leave us a review there if you liked what you heard or if you didn't uh, you could head us over you could head over to twitter and leave us some comments over there as well handles mentioned previously in the episode tell your friends and uh, I don't know, leave, you can leave us a review on Spotify too, I think. That seems like something you should be able to do. So give that a try if you're so inclined. And uh, we will see you guys next week. In the meantime, stay safe and keep on podcasting.